And if you have your Bibles, if you would turn to 1 John chapter number 4. 1 John chapter number 4 tonight. First John chapter number 4, we come now to verses 7 through 11. Believe it or not, the theme of God's love is still prevalent in this passage. In fact, it's prevalent throughout the entire book of 1 John. He will again bring us back to a thought that he has prompted to us earlier in regards to other people. You see, God's love, when it's on display for our life, ought to be displayed in our life as well. We were not saved, we were not loved by God just to live to myself. And here in 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse number 7, John now challenges us to respond in a particular way to the love of God. In verse 7 we read this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. Don't miss that little phrase right there. The world did not make up and create love. God created love. When the world wants to redefine love, understand they're trying, they're attempting to redefine what God gave to us because the Bible says for love is of God. It was not a human invention, a human creation. It came from the creator of the universe. Love did. And so I can't recreate it at my whim, at my feeling, however I want to. All right, I can't do that. It's false love. True love, right here, of God came from the Creator. For love is of a God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved. Now notice how verse 7 began with beloved. And verse 11 again uh, uses that same word to kind of wrap up this section of verses. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Lord, I thank you for this time that we have, these minutes. Lord, I pray that you would help us to look at your word in the light of your spirit, that you would reveal truths to us, Lord. That you would show us and reveal to us ways that we have been selfishly motivated. Lord, may we be challenged afresh with your love, your great love, wherewith you loved us. Lord, may we demonstrate that like we ought to in response to you in Jesus' name. Amen. An interesting concept here where John asks us or, or commands us and challenges us to look at the love of God in a fresh light. In chapter 3, he begins the chapter this way, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. He, in chapter number 3, when he really introduces the love of God, he begins to introduce it in a way that ought to inspire awe inside of us, ought to make us look at it and in humility respond to it. And throughout chapter 3 and now chapter 4, he is bringing different nuances, different facets to, to God's love. And here at the, in the middle of chapter 4, he brings another facet. He's mentioned this earlier about loving each other. But now he again says this, that if, that if because we are of God and because God has saved us, we ought to love one another. Now I have to ask myself the question, well, was this a big problem in the early church? It was the fact that, that, uh, that, that they, they w- couldn't get along? Was that what John was, was messing with? Was that the, what he was dealing with? With the fact that these early Christians were fighting with each other, that they were just arguing back and forth? And sure, we have some places, like in the book of Corinthians, where there was some division. But I don't believe that's why John was dealing with this in 1 John chapter number 4. I look at other places and I see in the book of Acts that people sold all that they had and shared it communally among everybody. I see some great instances of selfless and sacrificial love. I believe that John is going a step deeper inside of this love. I believe that John is now challenging us at a very foundational level. And the foundational level is this. At the bottom of me, I love me. At the bottom of me, I am more concerned about me than I am with you. That's my flesh. That's my old nature. That's what I'm supposed to eradicate. 
But wouldn't you know it? I'm talking about me. I'm not talking like in a, in a third person. I'm talking about J.D. Howell. You know that I have to fight that all the time? To be concerned about other people? Because I like me. I try to feel your pain, but I really feel my pain. Have you ever run into somebody else? Like bump their heads? Maybe you're bending over and both bump their heads? What is your first reaction? Is it, oh, are you okay? Then, ow? Or is it, ow, oh? And then when you see them on the floor in a coma, knocked out, you laugh? No, 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 no. You say, oh, what's wrong with you? We, we naturally, all right, humanly go to me first. And I believe that this passage, what John is beginning to deal with now at a foundation level, because of God's love in my life and your life, now I'm supposed to love one another. Remember, he's written this to Christians. You say, well, okay, Brother Howell, I love everybody. Now, he makes an interesting uh, phrase that I don't want us to be confused on. I believe it's verse number 7, where he says, And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Now, don't be confused on that. He is not saying, he is not saying that if you love somebody else, you're now a Christian. If that were the case, then everyone that, that loved a neighbor or a friend or a, or a spouse, a husband or a wife, would be a Christian. And we know that we're saved, we become a Christian by believing in Jesus Christ and his blood that was shed on the cross for us, not just by loving someone else. I believe what he's saying, though, is that a true Christian, someone who's truly saved, demonstrates this selfless love. That if God has done a work in your heart, then you will love others in relation as a reflection of how God loved you and me. Someone said this, that snowflakes are one of nature's most fragile things. I've had them land on my windshield before, right? And you can, whoosh, with one little turn of a wiper, Flick them off into the neverland of snowflakes. Someone once said that what? No two snowflakes are alike? Yeah, I don't believe that. In order to prove that statistically true, you'd have to have viewed every single snowflake everywhere, and no one has done that. So it is possible, it is theoretically possible that two snowflakes could be identical. All right, until you verify the knowledge that the other positive is not true. Yeah, but these snowflakes, I've had them land on my finger and they melt away, right? Snowflakes are one of nature's most fragile things. But someone once said, but look what they can do when they stick together. <laughs> I've seen them. I've seen them knock cars off the road. These cars going perfectly fine down the road. Snowflakes knock them right off the road, right? I, I've seen snowflakes make me break out in a sweat. I tried to get these little snowflakes out of my way. Those nasty snowflakes. What can God do when we stick together as Christians in love? God's love. I want to give us just three, three points tonight. First point is this, a true Christian demonstrates true love. Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God for God is love. You know, sometimes those that we know best are the hardest to love. You can love a complete stranger, but our parents, young people, your mom and your daddy you've now been cooped up inside with for six, eight weeks can be harder to love. But understand, young person, that uh, they may have just as much difficulty loving you as you do them. I would imagine that some teens can be annoying. I've never experienced that in my life, of course. I can imagine that. Sometimes those we know best are the hardest to love. The French apparently have a word. And it means me sickness. A sickness that can attack you when you worry just about yourself. The disciples had that problem. They were too much concerned with themselves. Despite all the strides that science has made, there's still no cure for me sickness. Humanly speaking. But there is, spiritually speaking, his name is Jesus, and he cures us from that remedy. The great physician brings a great cure for our hearts. You know, this world, if you listen to its philosophies and doctors and its experts, they'll tell you to worry about you first. In fact, I looked at one of these such quizzes. It said, take a quiz. Do you put yourself first or last? It was clickbait, and I clicked on it. 
here's what I found inside this. They, they said, uh, we want to see how you will fare. And if you're putting yourself first already, this is what the, this, this site said, then pat yourself on the back. Now, I've met some people who are really good at patting themselves on the back. Their arms are perpetually bent, it seems like, right? They said, keep up the good work. You understand the importance of self-care. And they had questions like this. Do you practice self-care? What kind of downtime do you know that you need? Me firstism. We are really good about caring about me. You know what I find? Inside of this COVID-19 pandemic, we're still really good about caring about me first. Oh, how do you communicate with people? Well, I can't wait till I can get out of my house. I, I, I. When can I get back to church? I want to see everybody else because we get kind of antsy, don't we? Locked up inside. I know it's not ideal situation. We know that. We know that. But we begin to worry about us first. And we put others aside because we're ultimately at at a foundational level. We are consumed with ourselves unless the Spirit of God touches us. He changes us. And God's love brings that change, brings that liberty. We're worried about me. Remember a few years back when I cut my finger. With my fall, I cut it with an X-Acto knife. I had it wrapped up. Came to church. It's one of those cuts that just throbs all the time. You've had those before. Not that big, but just you can't get out of your mind. Everything else that happened in life at that time revolved around the throbbing in my finger. Somebody at church... I had it coming because they were a smart aleck and I'm a smart aleck sometimes. They said, oh, I see you hurt your finger. And they grabbed it. (laughs) It's a good thing I'm saved or I'd be in jail today. (laughs) I tell you what. Now, they thought it'd be funny and it. I'm sure will be funny in about 30 years. As soon as the Lord gets some back vengeance as mine, I will repay, say the Lord. No, no. But you know what? The rest of that service, that finger was throbbing. I don't know what pastor that preached that night. Sorry, pastor. I'm sure it was powerful truth from God's word. I'm sure you preached that night. I don't know who else sang here this service. I'm sure some wonderful people sang. I'm sure it was touching. I don't know what hymns we led or that I led with my, with my right hand. I'm sure there are powerful hymns. You know what I remember from that night? Someone grabbed my finger. And I still remember it. Me first of them. I deal with me. And John says, but if God has touched you, with his love, which he has, then maybe you ought to love someone else in the same way. Meaning you ought to put them first. Because God put us first. He gave us his only begotten son, Jesus, the very best gift that he had. You see, we're all struck with this sickness, me firstism. And it rears its ugly head. It rears its ugly head when we go to the store. I had to wait outside at Kroger the other day because they had too many people inside. Shouldn't they have known that I was coming? Do they not know that I have things to do and places to go and people to see? Where am I going home? Who to see my family? That's the only place I can go. I had to stay, and it was cold out there. It got cold this past week, right? I'm standing there for a moment, and at first, first I'm like, man, it's cold out here. We're just about me. I said, oh, wait a second. Why am I more important than somebody else? It just rears its ugly head up all over the place. You're going down the road, not as much now, but before you're going down the road, and here I am in my truck, and someone gets in front of me. And they don't know how to read the speed limit and multiply it by two. Well, what, do we, what do we say? Don't they know that I'm running late? Don't they know that I'm in a hurry? Me firstism catches all of us. And that's what I believe John is dealing with in this passage. He says, listen, a true Christian shows, demonstrates true love because God demonstrated love for us. And this was manifested, the love of God toward us. God sent love, God sent life, and God sent liberty. He who is a bread of life began his ministry hungering. He who is the water of life ended his ministry thirsting. He was weary, yet he is our rest. 
He paid tribute, yet he is the king. He was called the devil and yet cast out devils. He prayed and yet he hears our prayers. He wept and yet he promises to dry our tears. He was sold for 30 pieces of silver and yet he redeems the world. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and he is the good shepherd. He died, he gave his life and by dying he destroyed death. The love of God was manifested to you and to me. You see the liberty that God brings. There was once a man named Charles Bradlaugh arguing against Christianity. He went to debate a well-known pastor in London. But the pastor said this, he said, I will, I will debate you, but I propose that we each bring some concrete evidence of the validity of our beliefs. I will bring a hundred such men and women who have been touched and affected by the teachings of Jesus Christ that I've taught them. And you bring a hundred who have listened to your teachings in rejection of God. He didn't want to say, but if you cannot bring a hundred, Mr. Bradlaugh, I'll be satisfied if you bring fifty. Whose lives have been touched, whose lives have been, have been changed by your teachings of atheism and rejection of God. He went on to say, well, but if you can't bring fifty, can you at least bring twenty? Could you bring 20 men or 20 women and, and who have been changed, who now no longer drink or who no longer uh, were unfaithful to their spouse? He said, if you cannot bring 20, I'll be satisfied with 10. He said, nay, nay, Mr. Bradlaugh, I challenge you to just bring one. Just bring one man or woman who will make such a testimony regarding your teaching. The story went, they said London was stirred. What would Mr. Bradlaugh do? In an answer, Charles Bradlaugh, with great chagrin and discomfort, publicly withdrew his challenge for the debate. Because they can't show anyone who has changed in rejection to God. And we can show hundreds and thousands and millions who have been touched by the gospel who are now different. God brings life and love and he brings liberty. So my response, my response to God's love ought to be love for others. He breaks it down in verse 11 for us, doesn't he? John, the ever-wonderful teacher for us, makes it simple. I'm glad he makes it simple so we can't miss it. He says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. You see, if you missed it in verse 7, if you missed it in verse 8, if you missed it in verse 9, if you missed it in verse 10, you can't miss it in verse 11. It's like he said, let me just put it down on the bottom shelf for you. If God loves you, why don't you... Get over yourself and love somebody else. A.W. Tozer said that if a hundred pianos are all tuned to the same fork, all are tuned to each other. And if we're tuned to the tuning fork of Jesus Christ, we'll be all tuned for each other. It was a Vietnam team who received the right to legally change his name. I will read his Vietnamese name, and I don't know how to pronounce it. It was My Fat Su Ning Roy, which translates to this, find 6,500. That's what it means, find 6,500. See, his father named him this after his father had to pay 6,500 for having a fifth child. Finally, this young teen could change his name to something more traditional. He changed it to what translates to Golden Dragon. You see, the father chose to name his son a name that reflected his own misgivings and problems about the birth. And that is often how we live. We tend to think in terms of others and how they affect us. I will show my love to this person because they have done this or they are like this. If I can just point out two words that I mentioned, beginning of verse 7, beginning of verse 11. Beloved and beloved. You see, God calls you and I his beloved. Not because we've done anything to make him feel that way. We love him because he first loved us. His love that we want to demonstrate is not demonstrated because of what we can do or did do for him, but because he is love. And my me-first-ism 
will be defeated when I begin to view others, not in what they can do, but in the way God has loved me. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for the love that you show to me and you show to me all the time. Lord, help us to not be so consumed with ourselves that we miss opportunities right now to show your love toward others. Lord, I know we're home right now and we can't maybe interact the same way, but we're still called to love others. Lord, I'm afraid that too often during this time we're just consumed with ourselves, our needs, our problems, our discomfort. Lord, help us to see how we can show your love to others, other Christians. I wonder if you're at home tonight or here, God touched your heart. If you've been concerned with you too much, oh, it's easy to get that way. I shared a couple ways that I am, and I could go on and on all night about me. But I'm called to love others because God loves me. God touched your heart, would you? Bend a knee here tonight or bend a knee at home and bend your heart to Him. And maybe you're on the night listening and maybe you didn't know that God loves you. These verses tell us that God loved us and He sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Without Jesus Christ, we have no life. With Jesus Christ, we have eternal life. You see, God loved you so much that he sent his son Jesus to die for you and for me. And Christ came to earth, born of a virgin Mary, lived a holy and a sinless life. He died on the cross to pay for the sins of the world. The Bible says that if we trust him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved. My friend, you may not know that you had a home in heaven, but you can have one if you trust in Jesus Christ. If you believe that Jesus died to pay for your sins, the Bible says, for all have sinned, everyone's a sinner, and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, and is separation from God. But the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God has a gift for you, and he has a gift for me. That's life in heaven with him forever. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For by grace are you saved through faith. But not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And my friend, tonight you can trust Jesus Christ. You can believe on him and he'll save you from your sins. All your sins, those you have committed, those you will commit. Would you trust him tonight? Would you believe on him tonight? Would you ask him to save you? Sometimes we'll help someone pray a simple prayer like this. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin. But I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. He was buried and rose again. Please save me. I trust in Jesus and him alone. You know that if you ask Jesus to save you, trust in him, he will. Would you pray to him tonight? Would you believe on him tonight? It's not in, the, in the, the words, but it's the heart that man believes. Right where you're at, you can call on him tonight. You can say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Tell him, he'll hear you. I know I deserve to pay for my sin, but I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me. He was buried and rose again. Please save me. I trust in Jesus and him alone. I'm here to tell you that if you asked Jesus to save you, if you believed on him, if you called upon him, the Bible said that God saved you. It's the best news we know. Would you do me a favor? If you did that tonight, if you asked Jesus to save you, would you let me be an encouragement to you? I'd love to send you a free book. It'll help you in your walk as a Christian. On your screen, there'll be a phone number, a website, an email address. If you'd be willing to just jot me a note, leave me a message. Say, Pastor, I pray that. I'd love to rejoice with you send you a book and help you grow as a Christian. Lord, thank you for what you've done for us. Lord, I pray that if someone's listening tonight and they're not sure they're on their way to heaven, that they would believe on you tonight. 
thank you for your love that you showed to us. Help us to love one another with that same love. In Jesus' name, amen.